you know, Bo, who's my eldest, is saying, like, stop burning things. <laughs> um, but actually, I think, you know, I asked him, like, what does daddy do at work? And he just says, make batteries for money. <laughs> 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 and so maybe that's my uh, commercial side rubbing off on him on all the wrong yeah. ones. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show podcast. Today we're talking sodium solid state lithium free batteries. Now sodium, which makes up about 40% of salt, is cheap, it's abundant and critically we have a lot of it here in the UK. So unsurprisingly, it's getting a lot of attention with people like BYD building sodium gigafactories as we speak. But the question is, could this be where the UK really cements its position as a global leader in this battery ecosystem? Well, very shortly, I'm going to be joined by Will Tope, CEO of Lena Energy here in Lancaster, and Arvin Sabawal, who is chair of the board. But before we get to them, two very quick things to tell you. First of all, I'm Imogen Bogle. I am one of the presenters here on the Fully Charged Show and the Everything Electric Show. And whilst I am truly biased, I do highly recommend both of those channels. So do go and check them out once you've had a little foray into the world of salty batteries. And secondly, I have to tell you about our Everything Electric live shows. Next up, we're at the London XL at the end of March, and it is going to be a fantastic festival of clean energy and electric vehicles. There'll be some sensational speakers. Uh, there'll be all sorts of home energy technologies to see and to try out and to speak to the experts, as well as an absolute ton of electric vehicles to test out for yourself. And of course, we'll be there. And it's always so wonderful to meet our community of viewers and listeners and to find out what you really care about and ensure that we can do future episodes on the topics that really mean the most to you. But enough of that. All of the details are in the show notes. Let's get into the salty batteries. Will and Arvin, it is such a pleasure to be here. I have so many questions, many of which I think are really going to expose my ignorance and my uh, sort of desperate scramble for my GCSE or high school chemistry. So let's see how we go. Please be patient with me. Um, but Lena Energy, you make low cost, solid state sodium batteries. Many words in that sentence are deeply appealing. But can you give us an overview of, of what exactly that means and why is it in any way interesting? Sure, I think I'll, I'll answer that one. If we pull apart the different pieces then, I'll maybe start at the end and, and work backwards. Uh, so sodium, that is really the fact that we make these batteries out of sodium as opposed to lithium. Solid state refers to the electrolyte we use. So whilst a traditional lithium ion cell will use a aqueous solvent uh, as the electrolyte, what we use is a solid state ceramic and that acts as both the separator as well as the, the means of ion conductivity. And there's a ton of benefits on why we would do that. We can maybe talk about that later. And so finally, low cost. Uh, and that really comes from, one, the fact that these are sodium batteries where the raw material is salt, but also the other active materials are things like iron. So we're really making a battery out of the cheapest, most abundant raw materials we can. And that's really core to, to the mission here at Lena. Could you describe the benefit of a sodium battery versus lithium because we you know we've heard all sorts of things like you can fully discharge sodium we hear that they are maybe safer but could you kind of give us a paint a picture it probably is best to say why did we choose the sodium chemistry we we've got in our batteries um because again you know this this chemistry was originally developed in the 1980s why did we love it so much uh, one is that it's made out of salt food grade salt and iron <laughs> so it's really really cheap um even at small scale. Uh, two is it's inherently safe. So we have some really boring videos where at temperature while cycling, we run a nail through our battery cells. And <laughs> instead of the fireworks, the, well, that's the point. Instead of the fireworks yeah. that you want to see, it's just, and it yeah. just, it just um, shorts out without any smoke, without any fire. Um, there's the sustainability angle as well, right? In terms of resources and supply chains are much more favorable. Uh, and they are easier to recycle because you don't have to go through any pyrometallurgy with black mass. Um, it's really, really simple to, to separate out a few uh, metallic elements. Uh, and then finally is that, that wide range of operating temperatures that this chemistry gives you allows us to do all sorts of interesting things, playing with temperature, operating at higher temperatures, is, which is what we choose to do. Um, so this combination of all those things is why we thought this chemistry is perfect for stationary storage. Uh, and, and just on the 
fundamental level as well. I should go without saying that the, the real exciting part of that chemistry is its stability. So, you know, a lot of folks, when they're building a new battery, they're going to spend years and years in labs chasing side reactions down, trying to make sure they can under underscore their stability. This chemistry has been proven to cycle for 7,000 cycles. Uh, it's got zero side reactions, got shelf life for 20 plus years. And so, you know, you're dealing with something that is bankable, right? Mm. And so when we talk about sodium, as you rightly mentioned, it's that so sodium is super abundant, that, you know, it's, it's what, 40% of salt, pretty much. Um, but is it the reality that actually when you put all of these components together, it does end up being cheaper than perhaps its lithium ion Absolutely. counterpart? Absolutely. I mean, that's an important fact. The, the cost advantage we feel that we have is, uh, it, that's a unique part of our proposition here. Uh, abundancy of sodium and also you don't have to do, you don't have to work as hard in getting sodium into a state where you can use it and it's viable as opposed to lithium and, 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 and all those other materials. And, and there's other consequences of getting lithium and what you do with it in the future, which, which, which we'll go into. But that's the key, really. Sodium's everywhere. And, and the key there, sorry, being the sodium we use in our batteries is salt. So we use a food grade salt as the raw material. Uh, it's not elemental sodium. Okay, hang on a second, because that was going to be my next question of, okay, we say sodium, we say salt, but actually we probably mean something deeply complex that we've had to dig very deeply for. Food grade salt. Is it's what a food grade battery. sodium chloride. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really quite magic. And one of the things that we're, we're filming this at your facilities here in Lancaster, which is not a million miles away from Cheshire, which is one of the biggest salt mines, something that I had absolutely no, no idea about until fairly recently. Um, but we have a huge supply of salt. So is this an area that A, has you know determined why you're based in this particular neck of the woods? And B, is this a big part of the supply chain that we as the UK should be saying, all right, let's 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 double down on this. This is where we could have true leadership. Well, yes, and I mean, sodium is everywhere. Sodium, Cheshire in the past, in his, history, in Victorian times, you know, they've got the mines. It's important for that. But, but sodium is everywhere. It, it's abundant. But the unique, the reason we're here in Lancaster is actually to do with people. Um, we have a unique team. Uh, so if I can go through that, you know, the founders came here to Lancaster uh, and amongst the founders was the, the chief scientist, which Rich Dawson, who is part of the university here. So they centered around that. And for me to get involved in early stage in 2019, I looked at the founders and they were a great set of individuals. They got together and they had a really good idea. It was a wonderful idea and they wanted to commercialize it. So between Rich, Gene, Mark and Tom, they got together. They, they formed this company in a unique location because Rich was a university professor at the university here. And they spun out of that. And then I talk about the people, why it's unique. Then you get individuals like Will um, and then you got James Morrish as well, who I term as, as near founders. And for me to invest in any company or be get involved with any companies, I look at the business proposition, what they do and the quality of that. And then you look at the people and the combination of those two things was, I have to say, unique. And I'm sorry to use that word. Um, <laughs> one of my very good friends, uh, Gary Jones at Lazard Ventures, always says, never use the word unique in a, in a, in a pitch, uh, especially early on. But it was back in 2019. So apologies, Gary. It was unique. And then the other thing for me is you, you, you make that step and it's a leap of faith of getting involved and investing in the last year or so I've got more involved, but it is the people here mm. and the culture and you've had a walk around here and the energy they have. And, and, and there's a real story here. This is going to do fantastic things for a number of people who are developing it at pace. That's mm. the key thing at pace. Well, I want to come back to the sort of the people and the culture component of this company as well, because I've had a little walk around and there are definitely some things that I want to ask you about. Things that I think <laughs> we need it fully charged as some additions to to our office, certainly. Um, but I think, you know, it, it is important to mention that this is a reasonably new company and starting in a new company or you know joining a new company. I always think it's kind of does it seem 80 percent exciting, 20 percent terrifying and that 20% that's terrifying is probably a nudge to do it. But also if you've got fantastic people around you, then it really softens that 20% fear factor perhaps. But more on the culture later because I've heard some pretty good stories <laughs> already. Um, now, there are a few sodium iron companies in, in and around uh, both the UK. Uh, we've been to see Faradian before. Um, I know there's recently been some sort of AI 
thing at MIT where I think they came up with a wonderful sodium ion chemistry. It's garnering loads and loads more attention. But the thing that always seems to come up is that the cathode is very secret. It's a bit of a secret source. Um, can you tell us why? And are they all, is everyone looking at sodium ion with regards to solid state or is that unique and specific to Lena? That is unique and specific to Lena. And I think more broadly, a lot of the recent news around sodium ion batteries is around progress towards a layered oxide approach to a cathode, uh, intercalating sodium ions into ch typically a hard carbon. And that stream of work is very much focused on fundamental chemistry set discovery, building a new chemistry set that they can cycle um, and they can ultimately commercialize into a battery. We, we have taken a very, very different approach at Lena, which was our chemistry set is something that was originally developed back in the 80s in Derby of all places and almost completely forgotten to the history books. Uh, and we had this, how, how it ever happened, you never know, but that unique set of uh, circumstances where our founders had a combined knowledge of ceramics out of the fuel cell industry and Rich, our, our, our chief technology officer, happened to be a geek around this, this old chemistry that everyone forgot and saw the opportunity to take modern material science, modern ceramics, apply it to that old chemistry, get all the wonderful benefits of this chemistry, but in a package you can actually manufacture cheaply, get it deployed. Uh, and so we are pretty unique in this space. Uh, that's also reflected in the number of patents, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other side, yes, uh, those who have, have found uh, what they want to use in their perfect layered oxide cathode or polyanionic cathode, uh, it's a different game um, to, to what we're doing. Our, our secretiveness will all be around the electrolyte mm -hmm. rather than the cathode. Okay, I've, this has opened up Pandora's box of some questions that I want to ask. I want to come on to actually what's inside the cell, talk a little bit about that structure. But before I do, I think we've got an example here. Now, if you're watching the podcast, you'll be able to, to see this. But if you're listening to it, I will describe it. We have what I can only describe as looking like um, quite a heavy metal bar, looks like a bit of a, a railing, perhaps. This, I'm guessing, was the uh, sodium ion, not sorry, not sodium ion, the sodium chemistry from the 60s or 70s that you described. The, it's known as the zebra chemistry, but yes, yeah. Zebra chemistry, which that is heavy, certainly not practical at all. And then we have this little biscuit, this very neat sort of almost half the size of a floppy disk, a reference which sadly might be lost on a huge chunk of our audience, um, but many others will be familiar, which is your version. And that is how we've gone from big metal railing into this neat little biscuit and shows that kind of, you know, how that technology has developed since being brought back to life. But what exactly is inside here? So I know that there's sodium. Yep. And I know that there is some sort of ceramic solid electrolyte. Could you just sort of paint a picture of what those layers actually look like and how yep. it's constructed? Sure. If, if you were to explode that and kind of look at each individual layer, you've got metal casings on the outside. Then you've got a cathode, which is a blend of that salt, food grade salt and uh, metals uh, like iron. And then we have a ceramic electrolyte, which also acts as that separator. And then on the anode side, we have a metallic sodium anode, and then we push that all together and uh, weld it all together into an individual cell. And then we stack the cells up together into ultimately modules and systems and something usable to, to the customer. I guess that maybe um, I'd said like a floppy disk, but actually maybe it'd be more accurate to say sort of a stack of BM biscuits yeah. is, is maybe more accurate or a uh, jammy dodgers perhaps. Um, but a couple of questions. So firstly, this chemistry was popular in the 70s, but it was obviously abandoned or not popular, but it was discovered, perhaps. Mm, yeah. Why was it abandoned? Why wasn't it something that, you know, we are familiar with now? Yeah, the two reasons on the technical side, what's inside one of those old metal bars is is a thick ceramic tube. And so when you think of ceramics, you traditionally think, OK, they could be brittle, easy to break, tough to manufacture and all as all of that is true to that traditional electrolyte and made it expensive. And then the second part was back in the 80s, 90s, there wasn't a great need for energy storage, which is where this chemistry really sings. Uh, and so the chemistry was shoehorned into markets where it really didn't belong, things like transport, uh, and that ultimately limited the commercialization effort. So it was in the wrong format at the wrong time. Wrong format, wrong time. Right format, right time of course. with this lovely little Lena biscuit. 
Um, however, I have to say, you know, we hear the term solid state. It's kind of regarded as this almost utopia of battery technology. I'm sure people in the lithium ion world would say differently that it's going to be a range of solutions. But the other thing that you hear is that, say, solid state and you hear about brittleness of ceramics because it is essentially the same material that you make a piece of pottery out of. Um, and that they're very, very difficult to manufacture. How are you overcoming some of those challenges? I think that comes down to having truly brilliant people. <laughs> and I think uh, having someone like Rich, uh, Rich Dawson heading it up, and, and, and that's very much the secret sauce of, of Lena, mm -hmm. of, of getting that combination of material science and engineering and the chemistry, getting all those things right, and, and getting a product that, that can achieve the things you want it to achieve. And I'm going to let Will talk about the market segments we're going for in a moment, but that, that combination works really, really well. And it's hard work mm -hmm. and, and there's trial and error. And, you know, th this is the stage we were at when we first started was, it was lab based scale up as it were, but lab based discovery. Now we're at the stage, I should say, we're scaling up. We're trying to get bigger mm -hmm. and bigger. So I think that's almost in the bag. Now we've got that sorted out the ceiling and mm. you know getting the cans together and all of that and, and, and scaling up but th that simply put as an early stage investor i felt that box was very much ticked and and, and you had and you're putting your faith into somebody and, and and those individuals um those brilliant individuals around rich we had a little little walk around the lab and there are all sorts of things that we could see and then there was a room that said here is where the secret stuff happens <laughs> and we're not going to talk about it apart from to say it's the secret source, uh, which of course then meant I was you know, peering through the window, <laughs> desperately trying to find out. But are we allowed to talk about the sort of steel plate armor, I suppose? Yeah. So that, that knowledge, again, from the people, really a lot of that came from the fuel cell industry. So if you think about how fuel cells have developed over the years, they were also similarly in a tubular based uh, format with a big th thick ceramic tube back in the Westinghouse concept. And then a lot of that research coming out of the UK progressed that into, if you think of a fuel cell today or a, a solid oxide ele electrolyzer, it's the stacked concept. Um, and so there was a lot of know-how and hands-on experience that the likes of Rich and Gene learned in that industry where they really cut their teeth. And that's what underpins all the ceramics knowledge. And, and again, so how do you get a ceramic thin enough to, to be flexible and dependable um, whilst, whilst the fact ceramics are traditionally brittle? Uh, one of the things we do is we, we stick it onto a very thin sheet of metal with a bunch of tiny little holes in it. And that gives it that armor to, I know we were, we were looking at some electrolytes, right? And you can, you can bend them and, and the, the conductive layer yeah. doesn't peel off like you would think it would. It's, it's nice and sticky. Um, and to do that, I've, I've just completely uh, done a disservice to Rich and the, <laughs> the, the team on just how difficult it is by calling it sticky and easily. Yeah. But, um, but as you say, that's where the, the secret lies. Um, yeah. Well, it, it, we had, a, I think, a phenomenal moment where we were looking at this sort of sheet of steel that has these tiny, tiny, tiny little holes in that goes on this very thin sheet of ceramic so that you get the, the strength whilst also retaining the flexibility of the ceramic, not losing any of the conductor properties either. And uh, Rich was obviously there. Um, and I was like, oh, it's kind of like, you know, you've got an armoured shell. And in my head, I was thinking about like a turtle or a tortoise and then again i have totally done a disservice to the fantastic <laughs> amount of science that's gone on but it really does speak to the fact that you know this comes from fuel cells and there is value of looking at an array of solutions and identifying the real best bits of technology such that you can fast forward you know 50 years from from this point where we have the old version of the zebra chemistry to this really neat piece of technology that's got all of those minds and expertise and patents over the years coming together it's it's extraordinary um but i want to ask about where this is going to be used because we haven't spoken about that yet and i think this is where this gets particularly interesting because sodium ions getting loads of attention from a cost perspective we know that byd are hoping to bring out a sodium ion battery car and um, jac have already launched one there's obviously companies like Faradian here in the uk looking at some automotive applications I think I will have to fact check that, but I think looking at automotive applications and of course, you know, when you look at, it could be a third of the price of lithium. That's a really, really big boon. But then the question comes around energy density and the fact that it's not 
quite as good as its lithium-ion counterpart at squishing loads of energy into a specific volume or weight. But you're not that concerned with that. No, it, it doesn't really matter to us given the end markets we're looking at. And I think that it's an important point here to get talking about the people. When Will came on board three, four years ago now, I, I think we were at a stage where it, when I was looking at it and I, uh, and investing and talking to other investors, I think, well, at that time, I, I think the web, <laughs> our website had so many different uses of a battery. And as Will described it the other day, it was almost like Google the word battery and then any application at all from, you know, power tools to torches, phones, yeah. everything. You'd, you'd throw everything in shipping, planes. Getting Will on board, we decided we're going to focus on one area and what we could see the real best use for this chemistry and the material science would be energy storage. And so we honed in on that. And then if we segment all the different um, chemistries and battery types, solid state so it works really, really well in that space just because of duration and, the, and then the curve we have in the energy usage and demand and so forth. All those very, very simple things to look at, it lends itself perfectly to that. Well, I mean, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> the Google? Yeah, I think... I'm a firm believer of you want to do one thing really, really well. Mm. And you can define the company by doing that one thing really, really well. And there's always a laundry list of things you would like to do. And then, okay, let's go after them once we're making a bunch of money. Yeah. Um, I think understanding where this chemistry can be most impactful in the shortest amount of time has really driven our commercialization commercialization but also the technology development plan. Uh, and just on the energy density thing, I, the irony being we can get a really high energy density in these cells, right? We have a metallic uh, anode, so that kind of inherent cap that, that sodium ion technologies have isn't applicable to us, but at the same time, we're not worried about energy density. The only reason I'm worried about energy density is the higher the energy density, the less cells we have per system, and ultimately we can get it even cheaper. So yeah. we will chase that, but uh, the end the end user doesn't really mind about energy density. And so so where, where are we targeting, I think, importantly? <laughs> we kind of dance around saying we're not doing a lot of things. What are we doing? Um, and it really comes back to energy storage, but what I would call longer durations of energy storage. Most of the grid connected batteries in the UK today are about an hour to an hour and a half, providing you know, real time balancing or, or keeping the grid stable. Uh, but you zoom out and you say, what's happening on grids all around the world? There's more and more renewable penetration. Uh, what does that mean from a flexibility perspective? You're going to need more and more durations of storage as you retire heritage peaking capacity and her heritage hydrocarbon capacity. And so this trend is coming. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And what we've done is said, okay, to get ahead of that trend, let's build the lowest cost four plus hour battery we can and get it disruptively cheaper than, than lithium ion. Uh, and then where that's taken us, is, is markets not just in the UK, and that, that might be interesting to talk about as well. Yes, I wanted to ask you, because um, I've seen various other podcasts that you've done, various things on your website as well, and you talk about the duck curve and how that has particularly meant that this long-duration energy storage sodium solution lends itself to India. Well, Tell us I'd say broadly, just say warm, warm, warm warmer, warmer climates, climates, you know, um, Middle East, I mean, Australia could be a very exciting market as well. I mean, you could see um, you know, solar farms out there using this sort of chemistry. And, and so, but yeah, warmer climates, it works better. And again, I'm going to let Will describe why, you know, there's, it's, it's simple. I think you know, my background is a chemical engineer, but, you know, it's simple physics, heat transfer and how it all works. Yeah. But, but it, it does work. And I, I, I should caveat that not just in your, don't want to, I don't want to narrow you too much, yeah. but as you say, markets where there is high solar uptake, massively growing grid requirement for whatever solution is deployed needs to be low cost speedy um but i know that and hence my question you you do have a, a pilot currently underway in india um right that's right here. yeah uh, absolutely and yeah and in and india is and i'm gonna again i'll let I'll, we'll talk about that specific pilot but let, let's go back on you india is obviously uh near and dear uh, to me, uh, I'm uh, of Indian heritage. Actually, I was born in India, and I'm very sorry to say I do reside in the UK. I'm a UK national, but I do support the Indian cricket team. <laughs> <laughs> Might not be doing very well short term um, at the moment as we record this, but let's see how the fortunes change over the next few weeks. But, but I I India is important to me, and I just see energy usage in India, and, and a couple of things happened 
over the last five, last five or 10 years, every time I visit, I see what's happening, urbanization, energy usage. And you look at something as simple as, as finance and banking, where through technology, through mobile technology, people in villages suddenly have access to banking. Yeah. Which they didn't have before. So they could put their savings, you know, with a local person, money lender, whatever, you know, n not ideal. And let's not talk about the, the, uh, the interest and all those dynamics, but they were less favorable, put it that way. But now you have, a, you, have, you have processes and apps in place and institutions are backing this, that that's making it more accessible for those individuals. What do they need? They need power. They need power. And the best way we can get that power is, yeah, rather than, as my children would say, burning stuff daddy which isn't a good thing to do we can harness uh, nature whereabouts in india did where um, did you grow up or were you born delhi De so all my family is in delhi um bar, bar my immediate family they're all day northwest india so ah. um I, I, this is totally off topic and i'm yeah. totally yeah. interrupted the podcast my husband's family um are from the Punjab region. Okay, so, so yeah, so so yeah. so I, I, I'm Punjabi um, uh, by uh, by background, and then I was actually I was born in a small uh, place. My dad was moving around with work, so a place called Dera Doom, which is now part of uh, Haryana, which is uh, you wouldn't know it, but it's sort of near some very beautiful mountains. There, you can see the Himalayas from there. But then we moved, uh, uh, and I've been in the UK for most of my life now. I'm, I'm totally taking this off track, but no, I can no, ask you about it. Well, we're heading back. <laughs> we're heading back. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. We're going to go do a health check on our, our pilot. It's been up and running about uh, almost a month now. Uh, and so we're going to go take a look at that. But back to what brought us to India. I mm. think it's that, that focus on where can this technology make the most impact in the shortest amount of time. And yeah. I know I'm repeating myself, but it's kind of the thing that I, I wake up and make sure that we're, we're holding ourselves true to. Um, and there was a combination of factors that led us to India. One is just the abundance of solar, how cheap it is and how it's how quickly it's actually getting deployed, yeah. leading into a steeper duck curve, as you, as you mentioned, which is really this phenomenon where you have a huge amount of demand peak in the morning and the evening that you can't fill with renewables. And that's really getting progressively bigger as a result of more and more people taking up air conditioning and using air conditioning yeah. by the time the sun has set, right? And so you've got this incredible macro set, set of, of um, incredible macros. Then on the technology side, lithium iron can, can store four hours, six hours, eight hours. It, that's not the technical challenge most of the time. Most of the time it's just economic. But in a place like India, where you're trying to install lithium alongside rooftop solar, the summers are 50 degrees, uh, it becomes a real technical challenge. Mm. And so that created this, this amazing opportunity to say, okay, the, the folks out there, the large industrials are actively trying to find a low cost energy storage solution to attach to their solar that will work in their climates. And the global south has kind of been ignored to, uh, f to a large degree in battery development. And that was what got me really excited and said, we need to, we need to pursue this as quick as we can. And the final topping uh, on that cake is that where can our batteries make the most impact, not just for the business, but as a means of, of climate, um, you know, climate change, uh, I guess, against climate change, <laughs> didn't put that that eloquently. But if you look at the global south, what's very common is that when the sun isn't shining, the backup capacity is still coal. They haven't mm -hmm. gone through gas transitions. And so when you just look at the carbon math, it is so compelling to get energy storage in place because for every megawatt you're shifting of solar in the middle of the day, you're taking away a megawatt from coal, which is completely undermining the, the, you know, the renewable transition out in India. So, you know, you can tell I get fired up on, on this because <laughs> yeah. it's just like, wow, we like couldn't have asked for a better uh, launch pad for this technology. And when you look at, I think it's the, is it the national electricity plan in India? Like they're like, yes, storage, come on, we want you. Yeah. Um, but you have reminded me, so we're talking about operating in temperatures of 50 degrees C sometimes, yes. not necessarily well suited to lithium. But the leader solution operates at 250 degrees C, which I'm having to totally believe you because when I touch the top of the uh, battery pack over there, I mean, it's not even a little bit warm. It's not even tepid, but inside it's operating at 250 degrees C. Why is that? So, uh, you might think we're crazy, but this is where you listen <laughs> to science and math and thermodynamics. Um, the fundamental challenge with a lot, a lot of electrochemical devices is that every time you cycle them, they create heat 
and heat is the enemy of most electrochemical devices. And so to counteract that heat, you typically then need to spend a lot of money and energy to get rid of the heat with a liquid cooling system. So that's today's status quo. Our approach was, okay, this chemistry can operate in a very wide range of temperatures. What if we designed it in a way where we could use heat to our advantage and get rid of the complex thermal management system in something very, very simple and cheap? And so we choose to, to operate at 250 degrees because every time we cycle the battery, it's generating enough heat to maintain itself at 250 degrees. Ah. And we do that with vacuum insulation, which is the exact same technology as a thermos flask. And so that approach is quite radical. <laughs> yeah. It's counterintuitive. Uh, and the first time Rich was explaining this to me before I, before I joined the company, I had my, my doubts. But as you say, once you, once you touch a battery pack, once you hold a battery pack, once you put your hand on it, you kind of realize, okay, the yeah. insulation is really easy here. <laughs> and, and we shouldn't take credit as Lena for, you know, wow, look, we can use insulation because it really is that simple. That is, and as I'm, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking about, you know, we've got this ceramic electrolyte. I'm thinking about putting a plate in the oven versus a very icy cold plate. Which one is more brittle? The icy cold one. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, again, I've totally been completely reductive as the science there, but I can, that's how I started to think about it. Um, so there is clearly an enormous long duration energy storage market within the global south. Here in the UK, it is a little bit different. Um, we were chatting before the podcast about things like we have the options of interconnectors. We have various other bits and bobs where we can import energy rather than just having to purely store it. So how does the market look for for Lino here in the UK, perhaps? I think if you look at the UK and, and Europe more broadly, there's still that requirement. There's definitely that requirement. And infrastructure isn't there right now but I think what we're trying to do would make it more viable to use this chemistry set. Um, suddenly the economics change for mm. you even here. Um, and then just from a resourcing perspective and recycling and, you know, we'll can go on to sort of things like black mass, et cetera, et cetera. This is inherently clean. So mm. yeah, you're, you're clean because you're getting energy from nature, but then the other side of it is at the end of the day, it's sodium. And everything's, you know, massively recyclable. Everything, every bit of that is. I'm looking at the the biscuit as you described, and I like the the BM biscuit. Yeah. Idea. And it's just getting to that time where I normally have my coffee and a biscuit. So that that's a, okay. I take that in my head. But anyway, but 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 that that's the big thing. And if you are one, you know, a more let's say a progressive individual on uh, on energy storage and energy usage as a as a government or even a local authority, this this really needs to be looked at. Mm. And the the UK just published uh, a couple of weeks ago their cons consultancy uh, consultation on long duration energy storage um, and they recognize in that it's recognized this is coming and again that the reason we're going to need it is because the UK is really leading the way in just how much renewables we're able to deploy right yeah. we're at 40% odd last year which is incredible like how quickly that's happened and so as we continue to rise it's going to be more and more pressure to put long duration energy storage in and it's been 40 years since the UK installed a long duration energy storage system right uh, so and are you referring to it a hydroelectric dam pump, like pumped hydro pumped yeah. hydro yeah. yeah yeah which is a great technology but yeah. you need you, know, you need a somewhere to put a lake um, that's the only issue with it. somewhere uh, to put a lake yeah. small so barriers not, not, no, you can't put it on a rooftop with your solar yeah. panels but um uh, but it is a really good technology and so in that i think the uk has recognized there needs to be a means to incentivize this mm. they recognize that uh, it not it doesn't just have to be long duration energy storage like you said we've got interconnectors we've got other means of power to x um uh, solutions but they've recognized there's around 30 gigawatts of of long duration energy storage or other means of flexibility that we need to build in. So mm -hmm. it's there. And ultimately, you know, yes, we have that really great advantage, technical advantage mm -hmm. in high temperatures. At the end of the day, this is just a cleaner, cheaper, safer battery. Uh, yeah. So it has absolutely has a place here in the UK in that LDES space. And it's interesting because here in the UK, I think we are absolutely sensational at generating really wonderful science, really fantastic IP. It's challenging to scale up. I would say, or well, certainly that seems to be our perception when we have this helicopter view of the various goings on across the battery landscape. You are at that sort of critical juncture where you're coming out of R&D mode, scaling up operations. You've got fantastic things in the field, getting that kind of feedback. But are you experiencing those challenges? Is it challenging? And I suppose if you could have, you know, a real wish list of things to make your life easier, what would that look like? I think it's, it's all to do at this stage with partnership. 
and finding individuals, organizations. And it's not as simple as pounds or dollars through the door and onto the balance sheet. It, it's people who can help us with that scale up. And, mm. you know, despite having scale up in some of the work I did um, at, at university, it, it is so, so challenging. And there's only so much we can do. And, and Rich would agree with that. We can do so much. But if we're going to do this at the pace we require it to be done at, we do need partnership. And we, we, as recently as, you know, I'd say the last three, four days, we've had some great conversations within individuals and organizations that are going to really help us do that and, and take us through that at the pace we need to do it. Um, Lancaster is home hub and all the, all those good things, but, but really this is a global enterprise and uh, making this the hub, but you know, our spokes reach everywhere, really, be it Europe, Middle East, India, Australia, we can go anywhere. So we're looking for partnerships and, and it's simple, simple chemistry. And, you know, yeah, we might have degrees and PhDs in chemical engineering or chemistry, but, you know, it, it's, it's simple enough to understand. And the maths and the numbers work. That's the key thing. Mm. On that, I think one of the biggest barriers to scale up, and I think we're, we're very focused on batteries and, yeah, yeah. and automotive, and both of them have a common trait, which is to get your first real meaningful factory, oh, it's just going to cost three billion, right? And <laughs> yeah. you need a gigafactory, right? And that's quite unique, actually. We, t we take it for granted that that is what every company experiences, mm -hmm. but it's not at all, right? Most enterprises, you get uh, a factory or something and you can get up and running and then it's your profits which fund your, your, your next scale up. Um, that is that is something that most of the industry deal with. But again, one of the, the differences in strategy we have is our, our cost advantage comes from the raw materials mm -hmm. and a, kil a ton of salt is cheaper than a ton of lithium carbonate, uh, but so is a kilogram. <laughs> and that cost advantage really does scale. Hang and on, so hang on, hang on. Let me just, I, I just need to check that I heard that correctly. So a ton of salt is cheaper than a ton of lithium. That makes sense. Yeah. But a ton of salt is cheaper than <laughs> no. a kilogram. No, I just meant at a kilogram oh. scale. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, wish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish. I was going to say that. Be, not right now. Lithium's, <laughs> lithium's taken a bit of a nosedive. But uh, uh, but the point being that we, we still yeah. have a cost advantage, even at a really, really yeah, small scale. Yeah. And so when we've brought in help, we've done pre-feed studies with Comal, who are part of the Stellantis group, recognizing that we're not going to go through the self-discovery ourselves. We want to bring the experts in. So, so Comal, for those who don't know, they're a huge robotics company, help with a sort of um, automating assembly, production lines, that kind of thing. And Absolutely. You're, you've been working with them at fairly recent partnership. I think. Uh, it's been in behind the scenes for quite ah, a while. Yeah. It's just recently uh, public <laughs> uh, on the basis that we've completed our pre-feed. And, and that leads into a cost model that then we bring other experts in to make sure they're, they're mm. providing their due diligence, independent perspective. You know, Halliburton, we're part of Halliburton Labs, they're an investor in us and they have a huge scale um, uh, automation and manufacturing teams that they've come in and you know, scrubbed mm. it and made sure that um, we're doing things the right way. And all that leads to the fact that we can, we believe we can profitably manufacture these batteries at a megawatt hour scale instead of a gigawatt hour scale. Mm -hmm. And so that means we have a very different approach where we're not just forever waiting to the point where we can build a gigafactory. We can go set up a plant at a much smaller cost anywhere in the world, validate your, the technology and do that again and again and, and scale ah. a lot more organically. So let me just check if I've got that, if I've understood that correctly, because of the cost of raw materials um, and obviously assuming that you get the right level of automation, actually you don't need to make these at gigawatt hour scales or huge ginormous gigafactory scale in order to make the economics make sense and for it to be profitable. So deployment in theory should be more straightforward. More, more organic, right? We don't need right. to raise a billion dollars before we start making profit, which as, <laughs> a, as a business person makes me, <laughs> is a huge relief to me. But if anyone wants to give you a billion dollars, oh, that's... I'll avoid it. <laughs> we, we, yeah. we, we, we could make use of that. But, you know, as an investor coming into this, all of that made, made sense to me that the scale of investment required in order to get to scale up, it was... Yeah, it was feasible. It, it wasn't yeah. outlandish. You didn't need something, you know, you didn't need a nation state behind you, put it that way. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's it's that point. And, you know, we have the know-how and the partnership. So, yeah, Kamal, and I know uh, Fully Charged is, uh, you have your, uh, you know, autos and uh, and the car background, a lot of people, but that's part of Stellantis. I mean, yeah. they know 
what they're doing. Yeah. They absolutely know what they're doing and having them with us. Halliburton again, great win, but Halliburton, huge, huge organization, oil services company in the US, one of the biggest. And they've backed us as well and we've got into their accelerator program. So we're at that phase where we've got the right partners and then you know, let, let's see where we can get to pretty quickly. But I think it's going to be an exciting space in the next you know, six, 12 months. We'll be doing different things. And back to people. I think that's a recognition from the start mm. that whilst we're working with folks who know what they're doing, uh, what we, when we know what we're doing best, it's the R and D <laughs> right? yeah. and the innovation. And there was a conscious effort to recognize rather than go through that self discovery of learning how to be manufacturers as well. Let's try to accelerate that as quickly as possible and, and not waste money teaching ourselves, but rather inject that, that knowledge from mm. the outside as quickly as we can. That's a perfect segue because I want to talk to you about people and the culture of working here because we arrived today walking around, you know, it's quarter past nine in the morning and people have enormous grins on their faces. It's like they're <laughs> here on a Friday afternoon and it's absolutely neither of those things. Um, and it's clear that there is a really wonderful culture, which I'm, I'm sure is, is totally intentional. And that's so critically important when this is hard. Making this at scale is going to be hard and you need a wonderful team to sort of make it worthwhile and to take you through those dark days that inevitably there are so give us a sense of of the flavor here and and perhaps the specific way i'll ask this question is give us an idea of the kind of very specific leaner banter and you know for example on a fully charged side our specific banter is that oh we've been put up in a, a premier inn on the m6 jack's in a really lovely <laughs> luxury five-star hotel with uh, stellantis or whoever mm. um or, you know, arguing about frame rates and things on cameras. So give us a give us a flavor of what happens at Lena. Again, I'm so I'm not day to day. You got everyone to understand that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a non exec um, in the Lena family. But what I see is I, 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 it is unique because the job is very, very hard, but you need to keep it in a in a friendly um collegiate but it is academic at the back you know it, it, ultimately you know they, they've all a lot of people have stemmed from academia but there's this commercial edge so having that combination of will james morris the cfo together with these people it's unique and then just indulge me for a moment when i've been investing in, in the past in public markets and equities that you know we look for companies that have the right culture mm. culture is so so important and when I've got investment wrong, and I have, you know, you do get it wrong, it's usually not enough work on the management and the culture, mm. or it changes very, very quickly. What I've seen in my journey with Lena over that time, it's been pretty consistent. And the people, a lot of the individuals who employ one, two, three, four ex-founders, and they're still around and they're happy and they've got smiles mm. on their faces and you know, coming back during, during maternity leave, coming with the base, seeing them, all those good things. The banter bit, because I'm not here day to day, I'm going to let Will take. But the little bits I see, I, I, I come back for more. It's really interesting. Whenever I do make my visits, oh, how's that going? What happened? Can I see some pictures? We, we, we shield as much as we can from you, Arvind. Um, yeah, there's so much I could get myself in trouble for you. It just sounds uh, absolutely insane. Um, so one thing, we take fancy dress very seriously so there's been times where we've had western wear friday where the entire labs had you know cowboy hats on and stuff <laughs> we had the eurovision of course that was very serious uh, salute to services day where obviously you know oh. i came in my full camouflage um and uh, never underestimate an engineer's capability to build a good costume um what uh, another thing we had last week was lena bingo so someone drew up a bingo board <laughs> of all of our tropes and uh, Rich, we've spoken a lot about, um, bless, bless him, uh, the worst he will cuss is he says, oh, crumbs. And you know things about him, he <laughs> oh, says, oh, no. crumbs. But that was one of the things to check off on Lena yeah. Bingo. And so he, he had a moment and it's like, oh, crumbs. And the entire like room is, yeah, <laughs> bingo. Yeah. I don't know if he realized what quite happened, but uh, there's a little snippet. But I do, when you think about our progress towards climate change, and I was at COP recently and they, there was this 
global stock take where it was, we're nowhere near the 1.5 mm. degrees C uh, ambition we all set ourselves. And, and I was, you know, a lot of people said, why aren't we doing this? There's clearly a ton of desire and everyone mm. listening to this has kind of got an inherently, uh, they're inherently driven towards this mission. And the reason is it's really hard, right? Yeah. Building new climate tech uh, to really get out, deploy into the world and make a difference is hard. It creates, it requires the great minds like you've, you've met today down in the lab working day in, day out. Mm. And, and it's not a journey where you go from point zero to point one. It's nothing but smiles. <laughs> yeah. it, it, is, it is set back, set back. Then you have a great day and you make a bunch of progress and set back and then you burn out and then you set back again. And then you do another great thing and then you burn out again. And it's only when you really, really zoom out, you start to measure progress, right? Yeah. And, and having a culture where people are holding each other up during those setbacks, um, as opposed to, to, to fleeing, is just critical because mm. deep tech is hard and you need to be out, you, you need to be there enjoying your workplace to, to get yeah. through it, I think. Um, and it's so inspiring when you see the, yeah. the work they do. And I mean, that's where the things you, you know, Lena Bingo, they sound silly, but they are not. They are so important when this journey is, is difficult. Um, so on those kind of difficult days, what what do you remind yourself as to the reason that you're here? Why do you do this job? What I saw was, you know, in the past, when there have been setbacks or their disappointments, be it lead times or simply put things not working or breaking, um, you, you look at the overarching reason why we're here and we're trying to help you know, build a better energy future for everybody. Mm. And that helps. I mean, that, that really, really helps. And if, if that keeps, you know, I can't think of anything better than, than that really, because if things might break, well, you're going to fix them. You have someone like Will in charge, really the guys will fix them. You know, we'll mm. do it at pace. We'll work longer. We'll work harder. We'll work smarter and all those things. But you, you look at that and how this is a better way of doing these things. And then you marry that up with everything's in our favor as well. If you think about, you know, the macro is, is on, people want to do this. The climate is, is there as well and on our side in theory and the markets we're looking at, plus the people combining all those things together, it's going to come right. You know, yeah. you just have to bear with it. And maybe on a more personal note, rather than the, the holistic uh, approach to it, I think that journey of setback, setback, burnout, then there's always a high, yeah. right? And and quite frankly, it's just addictive. Yeah. Is that, the, it, you know, I used to work in, in large corporates um, and I enjoyed that, but there's nothing like that feeling when you've yeah. made that breakthrough. You turn the system on for the first time in India and it's streaming results back to... Uh, uh, an office full of people anticipating to see yeah. what's going on. I mean, it's just, it's addictive. It is. So I should should uh, share with the audience that there is obviously the um, long duration energy storage pilot going on in India. You can see all of the results on a huge screen in the office. It's kind of like being in a space station. It's like, oh, I'm not yeah, going to yeah. go. You're indulging me there. I'm like <laughs> a huge SpaceX geek. Uh, my, my, my present to myself this Christmas was a little bit of the uh, Starship uh, exterior thermal, you know, thermal shielding that had fallen off the rocket that someone recovered in uh, in Texas. Sorry, I don't. No one asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to tell no, you no, how no, cool but, is it that. But it's space, yeah. It feels like that. And you're watching the results come through, or you know, thousands of miles away, seeing so a mission control, watching all of that, and that's really, really exciting. But I, I think, Imogen, you made that point of you know when you get into something you you know your stomach turns to be is this the right thing and you can feel like that and that that brings me back to in the investment side that you can often there's when when you want to invest in something like this there is a leap of faith you're saying does it make sense is it going to work and i get i get that fully and i remember in 2019 when when i came in with a couple of friends and we we looked at it very very carefully there was that stage where i i wasn't sure and it brought me back to another person just to me, one of the greatest macro investors I had the great pleasure of working with was, was Dave, Dave Fishwick um, at M&G. And, and that's something he taught us all that you will have your doubts. And sometimes it's OK to feel mm. and he used to say, you know, you feel a bit sick about it at the time. And I did. I remember walking away in September 2019 thinking, yeah, these are great guys. But that's a, we're writing a big check here. Is this going to be right? But being there as early stage investors and, and now I look at it and now we've got people like Will here. It feels right. We still get moments like that, but there is that, oh, I haven't yeah. done the right thing. And Dave's absolutely right. You always, unless, if you don't have that, sometimes maybe it might just be too good. Yeah. I sort of imagine it as that kind of, you know, pulling back a catapult and you're like, 
oh god it's gonna <laughs> and then ping and you get a lovely well, ideally you get a lovely trajectory into the future um i have got one more question to ask you now something that we find is pretty typical um of people that we interview is lots of people have you know, they've worked in the oil and gas industry or they've worked heavily in sort of combustion engine vehicles. And I don't mean to demonize that at all. I think, you know, we've gone through a huge cultural shift aside from anything else. But what tends to happen is that these people that we interview, um, their six or seven year old turns around to them and says, what are you doing at work? <laughs> is it a sensible thing to be doing? And that has kickstarted a change of career into something that's maybe looking more at um, the broader clean energy space. And you do have a background in oil and gas, so you totally fit that mould. Um, I wonder what that journey has been like for you and what perhaps prompted your exit. So I was a chemical engineer out of university and then I joined ExxonMobil as a process engineer. So I spent a year at the refinery down in Forley and then quickly got moved into the commercial side of the business, doing a variety of stuff, able to travel all around the world, fantastic stuff, a great set of people. Uh, and then in 2019, I started working in energy storage. Uh, that was really early days mm. for energy storage. Um, we were building a trading group at ExxonMobil and, you know, looking at how do, you, how do you invest in the right assets to monetize on the volatility that's going to come with uh, the transition. I, and working in that space at that time where it was rather crude, we, you know, energy storage via battery at that point was literally the exact same yeah. battery cells that would go into a roadster, into a shipping container, uh, connecting it up to the grid. And my... I, I guess my eureka moment was just there's got to be a better solution. There's got to be a right, right way to right size the tech for the problem at hand. And so then I started looking out for who are those people out there that, you know, I'm not a core scientist, so I can't be there for the very early days. I often think it would be really fun. But, um, you know, who had, who had got to the point where they've demonstrated proof of concept that's something mm -hmm. that I'm looking for and then found Lena and like Arvin mentions, uh, kind of joined in as a late founder and then uh, that progressed to taking on the CEO role. I, I never looked back since, I think. Mm. Uh, but but I do recognize one thing I will I do miss from being in the large corporate is it's sure it's really slow mm. to get to the point of of a decision and it feels restricted. But once you're there in a big corporate, you yeah. have this this huge amount of momentum behind you and and resource behind you. And and so that's why I think it's so important to maintain that collaboration between innovation on the one side, yeah. SMEs on the one side, and incumbent industry on the other hand. It's and part of the reason why I'm really proud of working with Halliburton is you, you're going to have to bring partnerships that allow us to put these first of its kind mm. projects out into the real world at large scale. And, and they're going to need to take some risk on that. And to, yeah. to do that, they need to be on board, right? Um, so that's that's ultimately how I, yeah. how I got here. On the kids stuff, I would love to say, like, I came home and uh, Arvin's got one of those moments, right? And, and you know, Bo, who's my eldest, is saying, like, stop burning things. <laughs> um, but actually, I think, you know, I asked him, like, what does daddy do at work? And he just says, make batteries for money. <laughs> 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 and so maybe that's my <laughs> commercial side rubbing off on him on all the wrong yeah. ones. But bless him. Uh, uh, he's that's a very home. good way of summing it up. I think that, that's be perfect. I mean, my the majority of my career has been in capital markets yeah so you know running money uh, putting portfolios together for for large institutions um governments and and helping their money grow like helping their uh, and, and then smaller scale you know ice investors pension for that's been in larger organizations started off uh, at Goldman Sachs, then moved, moved across and, and lastly was at M&G Investments. Now, now, when my children ask me, what do you do? Trying to describe how you put a multi-asset portfolio together <laughs> yeah. didn't really appeal. It didn't really appeal. However, they did know I was involved in Lena as a personal investor and uh, they were excited by that. And they met and they know, uh, they know Jim, one of the founders pretty well. They know Jane pretty well. And d just being able to describe what the battery does when you get your Amazon parcel and it says it's got lithium on it and it has all the warnings, and, oh, this won't have that, this is different. Mm. So they get that and they're old enough to understand that and they, and they like their science and engineering. And yeah, the commercial side as well, it's cheaper and it makes, it makes money at the end of the day. So that's pretty compelling. And yeah, as I keep saying, I'm an investor. Yeah, I, I enjoy investment and I see this investment, but there's, there's more to it than that. There's, there's people and passion behind it as well, which I really excites me. Like everything electric, 
you'll love our fun-packed Everything Electric Expos around the world. Next up, we're in London. Remember, energy and transport professionals go for free on the first day. That is sadly all that we have time for today. Thank you so much to Will and Armin for giving up their morning to speak with us. Um, my mind is totally blown by the fact that we are talking about food grade salt. Truly, truly remarkable. Uh, but thank you so much for listening. Please do make sure to like, comment and subscribe. It really, really helps us out and ensures that we can keep on sharing the important stuff in this clean energy transition. So if you have been, thank you for listening.